Let me see, I'm gonna... Can you see my screen? We can. Uh, it's very good. Okay, good. Um, well, thank you for that very nice introduction. I, I'm very uh, excited and thrilled to kind of be with you today and kind of show you some of the um, the things that we've been doing in psoriasis. I think my um, uh, research in psoriasis goes back 25 years. It's it's hard to imagine that I've been doing this for, for that long, but uh, it's been uh, you know very exciting. It, it's a very intriguing disease. Um, and even despite all the progress that we have made, and, and I'm going to show you some of it, uh, there's still so much that we do not know and do not understand. And um, over the years, I've been very privileged to be a part of the, uh, the Topman Institute family. It's been instrumental in my career and, and kind of helping us to kind of build our research and, and, and our research focus. And, 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 and again, what we, we do is, is to try to kind of under, increase our understanding of these diseases so that we can uh, eventually figure out a way to, you know, not just treat it better, but also to get rid of it, cure the disease. That's the eventual ultimate goal of, of everything that we do. Um, so what I'm gonna talk to you today about is, is, um, is psoriasis. I'm gonna give you a little bit of an idea what it is and what it looks like. Um, and then a bit of background about the, uh, the genetics and the immunology and how it kind of all ties together. So the title of my talk is Under Your Skin, Psoriasis and the Immune System. And um, just as a brief introduction, so psoriasis is a chronic inflammatory disease of the skin. It affects over 4 million Americans. Uh, it's about close to, and, and likely more, the estimates is, is about 2% of the population has psoriasis. Uh, the age of this disease is typically in adolescence between the ages of 15 and 25. Um, and once people get this disease, it, it doesn't go away. Uh, it tends to persist throughout life. Um, and there's, a, there's another peak later in life between the ages of 55 and 65 uh, as, as well. It's a disease that is found worldwide. Um, the frequency varies widely among different ethnic groups. So it's most common in Northern Europeans, where, where about two to three percent of the population actually has psoriasis. Uh, it is not, it's uncommon in Asians uh, and also in parts of Africa, but there are populations in Africa where you can find the same frequency that you can find in, in white, in, in, in Caucasians, about two percent. Um, it's actually not found in, um, in uh, Eskimos. And, and, and um, so there's definitely that kind of a genetic link to it. And one thing that is 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 um, common to psoriasis is that it's, it's equally frequent in, in women and men. And you can see some examples of psoriasis here on the right. Uh, some of these are patients that I've have I've seen in the clinic over the years, and you can see the, uh, the dramatic uh, manifestations of psoriasis. And you can also see and appreciate how different the disease can be from one individual to the next, even though it's all under the diagnosis of psoriasis. Um, it's a, it's a disease that is accompanied by arthritis in about 20 to 25% of patients. And typically this arises about 10 to 12 years after the onset of the skin disease. Uh, the reason for this lag time is, is, is not uh, known. Um, there are a few different subtypes of psoriatic arthritis. Uh, it's the asymmetric oligoarthritis. Uh, so it's a, a, a it's inflammation that affects the other joints of the hands and feet, typically in asymmetric fashion. So it's on one arm and not the other one, unlike uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, it can also be symmetric polyarthritis, similar to rheumatoid arthritis, and it can sometimes be hard to kind of distinguish the two. It can also be a spondylar arthritis, which affects the spine. Um, you can also have a distal interphalangeal joint arthritis, which is inflammation of the uh, the small joints of the uh, the hands and 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 toe, uh, and, and, and feet, so the fingers and, and 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 the toes. And then you have this um, uh, devastating form of arthritis called arthritis mutilans, and I have some photos there on the bottom of the uh, the slide to kind of show you what that actually looks like. This is the most devastating form of psoriatic arthritis. Thankfully, we do not see much of this anymore because of better treatments. Uh, and it's, it's dramatic how quickly this can actually happen. This can form in, in a matter of, of months. Uh, so again, um, this disease can, can be very severe, particularly the arthritis form of psoriasis. 
Um, it's an emotionally disabling disease. It's not, you know, most people when they hear about psoriasis, they don't realize it. Uh, it carries significant psychosocial difficulties. Uh, patients with this disease have concerns about appearance. They tend to have lower self-esteem. They experience uh, social rejection, guilt, embarrassment, and sexual problems are actually quite common. Depression and anxiety are very frequently found in this population. And they have um, prevalence of suicidal ideation and depression that is higher than that reported for all the medical conditions and, and certainly the, the, the general population as, as a whole. And again, not hard to imagine the effect on, 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 on psychosocial um, aspects of life when you see the patient that I have here on the right. This is one of my patients that I saw in the clinic a few years back. Uh, can be a, a terrible disease and very isolating. Um, psoriasis has multiple different clinical subtypes. Um, so chronic plaque psoriasis, that's what most people refer to when you hear the name psoriasis. Uh, that's found in about 90% of patients. Uh, uh, but even that has subtypes. So there can be large plaque uh, psoriasis, small plaque, annular psoriasis, flexural and inverse psoriasis that affects the, uh, the armpits and the groin. Then there can be rare subtypes such as rupioid, ostracious, and verrucous. Uh, these are kind of forms of subtypes that were kind of described in the uh, 40s and 50s and not commonly used anymore. Gutte or eruptive psoriasis is what you can see on the image on the uh, right. Uh, this is the form of psoriasis that is most common in, uh, in teenagers and usually follows a strep infection of the throat. Sepal psoriasis, which can, behave, which can look like and behave pretty much like a separate dermatitis. It's limited usually to the scalp and, and belly button. You can have erythrodermic psoriasis where more than 80% of the body surface area is involved with red scaly rash. And then you can have pustular psoriasis and you can see uh, one image on the uh, right of a, of a patient with, with the pustular forms of psoriasis. That has five different subtypes. The generalized pustular psoriasis, annular pustular psoriasis, impetigo herpetiformis, which is pustular psoriasis during pregnancy. And then the localized variants that are pustulosis palmoplantaris, just uh, pustular psoriasis on the palms and soles. And then acrodermatitis continua of halopo, which is a localized pustular psoriasis just of the fingers and toes. Uh, the pustular psoriasis, particularly the generalized variant, is, is the only form of uh, psoriasis that can be deadly. Uh, these patients are acutely ill. They have high fevers. Um, and often end up in the uh, intensive care unit because they're hemodynamically unstable. Uh, so a very wide range of clinical manifestations of psoriasis and, and, and some very dramatic presentations as, as, as well. Um, so the way to kind of appreciate psoriasis is, is, is practically that it's, it's, a, it's a truly a spectrum of, of clinical phenotypes or clinical presentations. On, on one end, you have the plaque psoriasis that you can see on the left. And then you have the inverse psoriasis, which is underneath the breast and the armpits and the groin. You have the erythrodermic forms of psoriasis, which is covering almost the entire body surface area with this diffuse redness and more fine scale than the coarse scale you can see in the plaque psoriasis. This is the acrodermatitis continua of halopo, the one that involves just the, uh, the digits. This is palmoplanta pustular psoriasis, so the localized variants of pustular psoriasis. And then generalized pustular psoriasis, which usually is explosive uh, with patients getting really sick. Uh, but this form is by far the most common and the other forms are much less common. And thankfully the pustular forms of psoriasis is the least common. Um, but one thing that we have, you know, wondered about, and, and again, it's, it's something that is still incompletely uh, understood, is whether the, uh, the psoriasis subtypes are reflective of, of different immune mechanisms. And that's, that's exciting because the treatment that works for plaque psoriasis may not necessarily work that well for generalized posterior psoriasis and vice versa. So this is a, a um, part of the psoriasis spectrum that is actively being uh, addressed and will be addressed even more in the, in the coming years. So one thing to kind of uh, know with, with psoriasis is, is that it's, it's more than just a, a, a skin disease. So psoriasis kind of goes more than skin deep. Uh, so patients with psoriasis have increased risk of cardiovascular disease, particularly uh, myocardial infarctions. 
And this has been shown to correlate with disease activity. So the more severe the disease, the higher the risk. And this is particularly in, in young adults, people in the 30s and 40s with the disease. Um, and, and patients with psoriasis also have increased risk of metabolic syndrome, uh, which includes stroke and type 2 diabetes. And then other associated conditions include non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, obesity, sleep apnea, and even COPD. So this is, is truly a, a multi-system uh, disease. There's been some work done on this. This is actually work that was published about 10 years ago. Um, and you can see fairly kind of typical psoriasis patient here on the uh, on your left. And you can see the disease activity, fairly diffuse activity. And you can see this patient is a little bit overweight, which is actually quite common in, in, in uh, we see in psoriasis. And this is a PET scan. So PET scan kind of measures metabolic activity. So wherever you have inflammation, you're going to get a stronger color. And the, uh, the dye also collects in the bladder. That's why it's very high here. And then you can see it's very high in the brain because there's very increased metabolic activity over there. Uh, but what you can see here in this graph is you can see the plaques on the skin. They're fairly faint, but you can easily see them. They're kind of a line up here on the skin. So again, psoriatic plaques are have increased metabolic activity. But what's striking is when you compare that against healthy control. Um, so this is your psoriasis patient here on the left. On the right, you have a healthy co control H matched. Um, what you can see is you can see the uh, psoriatic plaques here on the skin. They're kind of lighting up on this. You can see that there's increased uh, activity in the liver and that has been described in patients with psoriasis. But what's most striking is this diffuse line up along the, the blood vessels. Uh, so you can see the femoral vessels going down here, down to the tibial vessels. You can see the uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm, uh, abdominal aortic arch over here. So it, it's much darker than you can see here in the healthy, healthy individual. Um, so patients with psoriasis have uh, vascular inflammation. Um, it's probably most striking here. This is a, a PET CT scan. So you have a healthy control over here. You have the lungs, you have the uh, aortic arch over here. And then you can see how the metabolic activity in psoriasis is, is way out of proportion compared to the healthy control. And if you look at, you know, what's truly uh, driving this, uh, it's actually is the, uh, this is the uh, metabolic activity. Uh, on the PET CT scan, and this is the disease, disease severity. We measure that by PASI, which stands for psoriasis area and severity index. So the more severe the disease, um, the more inflammatory activity you can actually see in the blood vessels. So it's, it's quite striking. It's to some extent also age and sex adjusted, and also uh, it's independent of the uh, Framingham, Framingham uh, risk score, which is a typical measure of risk of, of, of uh, uh, cardiovascular disease. And this has been, you know, uh, kind of outlined pretty well, still things that are still unclear. This work has been led by uh, my colleague at, at the NIH, Dr. Nehal Mehta. Uh, he's been doing most of this work. He was the, he published that initial paper about 10 years ago, and he has kind of been leading the field in terms of addressing the, uh, the effect of psoriasis on cardiovascular disease. And this is a schematic that I took from one of his papers where you have the psoriatic plaque, you have the production of multiple different inflammatory cytokines. You also have the adipose tissue that can actually be quite inflammatory that also contributes to inflammation, particularly in patients that are overweight or, or, or obese. There are also liver abnormalities. The liver is, is, is a little bit inflamed in psoriasis and more so than control. So the reason for that is still not quite uh, understood. The patient with psoriasis also have increased risk of uh, fatty liver disease or steatohepatitis. Uh, so abnorm abnormalities in the um, in the um, in, in lipids, both uh, low density and high density lipids, um, and there's increased uh, form of lipid laden macrophages. So this all kind of contributes to like like that systemic inflammation in psoriasis, and that affects the uh, the blood vessels of the uh, the heart you kind of get an inflammatory environment that kind of promotes endothelial damage. You get influx of, of cells, particularly the macrophages and the, and the lipid-laden macrophages and the atherosclerotic plaques. And this leads to endothelial dysfunction and plaque formation. And again, this is, seems to be mostly driven by inflammatory cytokines um, and kind of provides 
also a way or potential way to kind of disconnect the skin inflammation from the, the risk of heart disease. And that's being actively explored at the moment. It's also quite striking to kind of look at the skin in psoriasis. So this is um, a histology that I took myself uh, about, I think, 12 years ago. So this kind of shows you the transition from normal skin um, or unevolved distant to, to the near edge, the center, and then the edge of, of, of plaque psoriasis. And you can see here, this is the skin. Uh, this is the epidermis and this is the dermis. You can see that Unavoid distant skin looks pretty normal, but when you kind of get close to the plaque, you get these subtle changes. The thickening of the epidermis is a little bit more stuff around the blood vessels in the skin. And then when you get into the plaque center, you get this very marked thickening of the uh, of the epidermis. And you get these kind of a kind of a elongation. We call this uh, ready packs that kind of a go and dive down into the skin. Uh, you get marked thickening. Uh, it's about five to tenfold thicker, you get this dilatation of the blood vessels, you get inflammatory infiltrate. Uh, and then in full blown plaque, like you can most often see in the active edge of the psoriatic plaque, that's where these changes are most marked. So this is the, the scaling, this thick stuff here on the surface. This is the thickening of the, of the, uh, of the epidermis. Usually in normal epidermis, about 10% of the cells are actively dividing uh, in, 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 in in psoriasis, it's about 100%. Uh, so they're all really growing really rapidly. And typically also, it takes about 30 days from the skin cells to kind of move from the bottom compartment to the top compartment in healthy skin. In psoriasis, that takes about six to seven days. So you can imagine all that activity and all, all the massive turnover that is, that is going on. And then you can see here, these are the blood vessels that are gonna go and dive up into these kind of a tongues that kind of reach out into the epidermis. And there's a lot of inflammatory cells here and those are the drivers of the disease. Um, and it's quite remarkable that when you treat psoriasis and you treat it effectively, these changes are completely reversible and this goes back to normal without any permanent scar or damage to the skin. And it's also given that, you know, this is so hyper proliferative. Uh, it's actually quite striking that psoriasis does not have increased risk of, of skin cancer. Um, so unique features that we you know still do not understand, but, but again, could provide some very interesting insights, not just into psoriasis, but also in, in things like skin cancer formation and the factors that protect against that, and also wound healing. Uh, this status that is here on the epidemics is very similar to what you can see in, in, in wound healing. Um, the cells that are going to contribute to psoriasis, they kind of uh, belong to uh, the innate and the adaptive immune response in the skin. So there is compartmentalization in the immune system. So the innate immune cells are kind of in the skin. Uh, that includes mast cells, dendritic cells, macrophages, sometimes neutrophils, and also uh, cells such as fibroblasts and keratinocytes. You have the adaptive immune cells, which is T cells and B cells. And then you have cells that are kind of in between these two different states. And the reason why we kind of talk about these two arms of the immune system is that they actually work very differently. So the innate response um, that is driven by the cells that I showed you on the, um, the previous slide, uh, they're characterized by, they have a very rapid response. Uh, they have pattern recognition receptors on the surface uh, that kind of allows them to kind of detect um, microbial, you know, pa microbial pathogens and things like that really quickly and react very quickly to them. And they make a lot of uh, inflammatory mediators such as cytokines and co-stimulatory mo molecules and then kind of direct and dictate to the, uh, to the other arm, the adaptive immune system, how to respond. Uh, and this part of the immune system is responsible for kind of uh, golfing up and, and, and clearing up uh, bacteria, uh, eating them up. And then also for making uh, small molecules, small peptides that have antimicrobial activity and can actually kill or directly kill pathogens. The adaptive immune response uh, is characterized, it has a much slower response, usually days to weeks instead of uh, minutes uh, on this end. Uh, the recognition is usually through low affinity receptors. Um, and this is what drives your T cell. And, and so T cells and B cells are the critical component of the adaptive immune response. So this is what ends up making the uh, the cell mediated responses and also the humoral immune responses, which are characterized by anti antibody production. 
And what's important with this is, is that this component has memory. This component over here has some memory, uh, but to a much lesser extent. Uh, and it's the interaction between those two compartments that kind of a drive um, psoriasis, or at least that's part of that self-sustaining mechanism. So you have these components on this arm over here, the innate immune response that, that you know, keratinocytes contribute to, uh, to that. Uh, white blood cells, sub white blood subsets such as natural killer T cells, plasma cytoid dendritic cells, maybe macrophages. They activate what we call dendritic cells or myeloid dendritic cells, usually through cytokines. And when those get activated, they activate parts of the adaptive immune response, which we call here Th1 cells and Th17 cells. These secrete other inflammatory mediators such as interleukin 17, interleukin 22, TNF, and interferon gamma. This activates the skin cells that produces antimicrobial peptides, more pro-inflammatory cytokines, and then chemokines or chemoattractants that will bring in additional uh, immune cells into the skin. And this creates then a self-sustaining cycle that kind of a, just keeps everything kind of a going. And this is kind of what it, what it, what it, what it looks like, uh, much more complex slide than what I showed you before. Uh, but it's kind of more reflective of what's going on in psoriasis. So you have these predisposing factors. Uh, they can be environmental, they can be microbes, smoking, trauma, stress, drugs. Um, but usually them by themselves don't do a whole lot unless you have the right genetic makeup to kind of get the disease. And today we have more than 80 uh, genetic loci that we have identified that predisposes to psoriasis. So if you get the right trigger, whether it's in the skin or the tonsils, like you can, can get in strep infections, you get activation of the immune system, uh, and that's the disease initiation that can happen in the skin, uh, or kind of through the um, through the tonsils. You get activation of these um, adaptive arm of the immune system called Th1 and Th17 cells. These go back into the skin, release these inflammatory mediators that act on the keratinocytes, and then the keratinocytes make more mediators that will both act back on the dendritic cells to kind of create a self-sustaining cycle. And also chemokines that will bring in a number of other immune cells that will kind of a drive and, and hyperactivate the immune response. Um, and you kind of get this very complex uh, feedback cycles, multiple feedback cycles in psoriatic skin that kind of help to kind of drive the disease and, and, and maintain it. So this is what drives the chronic phase of the disease. And I'll show you a little bit more about this later, but we have had uh, good success in identifying many of the genetic risk loads of that predispose to psoriasis. And many of them kind of contribute to different components of this whole cascade. They're involved in interferon antiviral signaling, epidermal function and differentiation, what we call auto-inflammatory responses that are more on the innate arm, but can be self-amplifying, TH17 and IL-17 uh, responses, antigen presentation, oxidative responses, TNF and NF-kappa-B signaling and IL-23 signaling and then T-cell development. So you can truly see how complex psoriasis is and how complex the genetic predisposition is. And this kind of a, is, is, is another kind of a more simplified version of this, this whole cascade that is going on in psoriatic skin. Um, it makes it a little bit easier because it will kind of a break it down into like three major cycles that are kind of self-sustaining inflammatory cycles that kind of drive psoriasis. One of them is, is involving the neutrophils and the IL-36 cytokines uh, or IL-36 responses. The other one is around IL-17 uh, and TH17 cells. And then the third one is more geared towards um, type 1 and type 2 interferon, so interferon gamma and interferon alpha. And these three cycles kind of coexist in, in, in plaque psoriasis. Um, and you have kind of a balance between the three, but what's, what's interesting is like in, in disease like plaque psoriasis, it's the interleukin 17 that seems to dominate more so than the other two. And you can see a picture of that over here on your right. And, and targeting IL-17 in psoriasis has been incredibly successful and, and, and a very effective treatment. We have what, what we call paradoxical psoriasis, which is psoriasis that sometimes happens in patients that are on anti-TNF agents, uh, which is also a commonly used treatment, but sometimes we kind of get worsening of, worsening of psoriasis, in, whereas most people uh, get better. So that's the reason why, it, why it's called paradoxical, because the treatment is supposed to uh, make it better. But in that, you get a shift towards the interferon responses. Um, 
And you can see that that kind of tends to look a little bit different than the, uh, the plaque psoriasis. And then you have pustular forms of psoriasis, which is the most formous, most severe subtype of, of, of psoriasis. And that's where the IL-36 responses are truly dominant. And that's what's bringing in the neutrophils that you can see over here. And that's what's really causing the pustules in this disease. Um, so a very dynamic disease. And again, we're kind of getting a better idea how these different cytokine axes can kind of uh, not only maintain and, 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 and maintain the disease, but also kind of shape the different clinical outcomes and different clinical presentations of the disease. And this kind of goes a little bit back towards the, uh, the genetics. Um, so again, this just shows you the progress that we made over the past 15 years. Um, much of this work has been led by Dr. James T. Elter. He's a professor here at University of Michigan, and he's been responsible for identification of the majority of the genes that we now know predisposes to psoriasis. Um, but this kind of shows you that the progress has been pretty steady over the past few years. Uh, there hasn't been much happening since 2017, so that's why I do not have slides for that. Uh, but we have one that is like uh, another study that, that is likely coming out later this year where we are practically going to get close to doubling the number of, of, of genetic risk variants uh, in psoriasis. Um, what this shows you is that many of them have uh, different roles and different biological functions. And, and what's striking is that many of them are different, associated with different forms of psoriasis. So HLACW6 is very strongly associated with gutted psoriasis. R4, R13 uh, goes with uh, arthritis. You have at least three genetic variants that predispose specifically to pustular psoriasis. Um, so it kind of gives you a very complex um, picture of, of how all these things kind of come together. What's also very striking is that um, psoriasis is, is, is not a standalone disease. If you look at the genetic factors that predispose to psoriasis, there's actually a very substantial overlap with multiple other inflammatory skin diseases. Uh, so psoriasis and Crohn's disease uh, actually is, is, it are very tightly linked together through multiple different genetic variants. Um, diseases such as uh, scleroderma also overlaps to different inflammatory mediators. Uh, Bachet's disease uh, goes through a uh, IL-23 receptor. And even rheumatoid arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis kind of link to psoriasis. So over here, and over here, and, and, and also celiac disease and even lupus. So um, what you learn from one disease can often also kind of provide insights into a whole range of other conditions. Um, so this is very exciting and, and, and again, makes you kind of think about these inflammatory diseases from a completely different perspective. So what about treatments? Um, we have certainly made a lot of progress. There's, there's certainly a lot of, of available treatments and psoriasis that have been around for the past 50 or 60 years, although the progress has really taken off in the past uh, 50 to 20 years. So psoriasis, so we have these uh, different groups of treatments. So we have the older oral agents, we have the anti-TNF agents, uh, anti-IL-12, IL-23, anti-IL-17, We've got new oral agents, and then we have these other treatments. And if you look at what's been used to treat psoriasis, not all of these are, are incredible, you know, very effective, but they have been used to treat psoriasis, particularly like a um, long time ago. So we have agents such as cyclosporine, methotrexate, acetretin, uh, sulfasalazine that are still used, but not commonly to treat psoriasis. You have five different anti-TNF agents. Uh, we have four different anti-IL-12, IL-23 agents. We have three uh, current anti-IL-17 agents, and then we have uh, at least a couple of, of newer kind of oral agents to treat psoriasis. And, and most of these, uh, you know, the, apart from these uh, seven over here, these treatments are all new. These have all been kind of coming out in the past, you know, 15 to 20 years. Uh, and made a huge difference in terms of how we can manage psoriasis. Um, and then all the treatments that, that we don't use a whole lot anymore for psoriasis. Um, but if you look at the, uh, the timeline, uh, this just kind of shows you how things are kind of progressed therapeutically. Um, it's gone up um, exponentially uh, over the past few years. So again, it's not until like the uh, early 2000s when things really started to kind of take off. And we have not reached the plateau 
yet. So again, there's still a newer agents kind of coming out. We've had a couple of dropouts along the way. Um, Alifacept was a biologic that was uh, in this, that came out in the 2000s. Didn't really work that well and was a bit of a hassle to use. So that's why it kind of dropped out. And then we had uh, Ephalizumab or Raptiva was a pretty effective uh, agent, but was associated with uh, a deadly uh, brain infection uh, that happened in about one out of 500 to one out of a thousand patients treated with it. And that's why it was uh, withdrawn and, and hasn't been in use for the past 15 years for psoriasis. Um, so again, not trivial medications by any means, but at least we have some very effective and, and what looks like very safe so far treatments for psoriasis. Um, what's interesting is, is that many of these actually, this kind of shows you the, uh, how these kind of biologics work. Um, so we have, you know, a few different key classes, the anti-TNF agents, the anti-L17, the anti-L12, L23, pure anti-L23 agents, and then this anti-CGLA4, which is currently only used to treat psoriatic arthritis. Uh, so many of the treatments act against TNF. Uh, you can see that that is mostly derived from dendritic cells, macrophages, and T cells, and act on the TNF receptors. You've got this group of uh, anti-TNF agents that kind of specifically block that. You have anti-L23 that comes from keratinocytes and dendritic cells, and that actually drives uh, production of IL-17 by TH17 and ILC3 cells or innate lymphoid cells. Um, that's driven by interleukin-23. We have ustekinumab that blocks the P40 unit of the IL-23. And then we have more specific anti-P19 inhibitors. That's what we call these true anti-IL-23 agents. And we have a four of them currently. And what they do is that they block uh, IL-17 production. You can see the uh, different IL-17 cytokines over here, and we have three agents that specifically block that, bimekizumab, ixikizumab, and secukinumab. And then we have one that acts on the receptor itself, brotolumab, um, that has a bit of a more broad effect. So the key pathways that are, we're truly blocking with the existing treatments and psoriasis are only two pathways. Uh, it's the uh, IL-17 responses and the TNF. And the reason why it's so effective is that there's actually quite a bit of synergistic effect of communication between these two receptors and, and they amplify the effect of one another. So if you take one out or both, you, you can really collapse the psoriasis, um, these kind of a self-sustaining uh, inflammatory cycles of psoriasis, and that can lead the disease to kind of a collapse and, 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 and often go away. Uh, but only while you're on treatment. So they suppress the, the disease, but don't cure it. So one thing that my lab and, and we have been doing lately is to kind of use um, these very novel technologies to really study in detail what's going on in psoriasis. So what this data shows you here is what we call like single cell sequencing. What that does is uh, it um, allows you to kind of look at the gene expression in skin in each cell that is involved in the, in the disease process. And when you do it, you, you kind of collect thousands of cells and then you can, can see and you group them together. So you have a cluster of what we call keratinocytes. So each dot shown in this image is, is, is one single cell. And for each single cell, we, we detect about five, six to, five to 600 uh, genes. So we can kind of group them together based on what they are. So we have keratinocytes, you have these immune cell populations such as myeloid cells, T cells, you have uh, blood vessel cells, endothelial cells, smooth muscle cells, the fibroblasts. We even get the uh, the pigment cells of the skin, the, the melanocytes, mast cells, nerve cells, and even the sweat gland cells. And this shows you how much the disease process actually really changes its rises. So the red that is over here and, and the green, that's what you can see. Those are the cells we get out of healthy skin and, and normal psoriatic skin. The blue is what we get out of inflamed psoriasis skin. So you can see these very big shifts in the, um, in the skin cells and, and how much more of these immune cells we find in psoriatic skin compared to uh, normal or non lesional psoriasis. And we see marked changes in, in multiple other kind of compartments in the skin. And you can look at the different genes that kind of characterize each, each cluster. And you can use this as a way to really kind of dig and take a deep dive into the disease process. And this is where the, uh, the future is in terms of how we're gonna move 
towards the next step in, 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 in psoriasis and how we can kind of figure out a way to really stop it. Um, and this is just an example of, of what you can do with data like this. You can look at the skin. This is the full thickness skin. This is the, uh, the leathery portion of the skin, the dermis. Then you have the epidermal compartment right here. The epidermis has multiple different layers. So you have the basal layer, you have the spinous layer, and then you have the supraspinous and the granular layer. And then you have the cornified layer that is, that is the, the most superficial part of your skin. So this is the outside, this is the inside. This shows you how it is in psoriasis. So this very thick scale, marked thickening of the epidermis. And then you have the leathery portion of the dermis over here. So with this technology, we can actually take the cells, the skin cells out of the, uh, out of the, out of the skin and see what they're doing and, and how they contribute to the inflammation. And you can group them based on whether they belong in the basal layer, the spinous layer, or the supraspinous layer of the skin. And then you can look at the healthy that you see in red, the uh, non-lesional psoriasis, the healthy looking skin from psoriasis patients, and then the inflamed psoriasis skin. And then you can look at the different uh, immune responses. Um, and what, what this shows is that for type one interference, most of it is in the basal layer and kind of goes down as you kind of move further up in the epidermis. Uh, TNF, which is one of those kind of a key pathways in psoriasis and IL-17A and to a lesser extent IL-36, most of that activity is happening in the, uh, the supraspinous compartment. So if this is where the, uh, the main action is going on in psoriasis, this is where the amplification is, is, is happening that is amplifying and, and making things you know, worse. It's not happening in the bottom layer of the skin, it's actually higher up. So can, can, can I give you very specific localization as to where things are happening and, 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 and even identify mechanisms that you can use to really target it much more specifically. What you can also do is, is to use what we call uh, spatial sequencing. This is a brand new technology that allows you to kind of look at the gene expression across the tissue. So this is a, a biopsy from a patient with psoriasis. Uh, I know it's kind of hard to appreciate it, uh, but here, the epidermis is over here. This is the leathery portion, and then the subcutaneous fatty layer is, is down here. And the spatial just tells you the number of, of transcripts that you can see. So most of the activity that's going on in psoriasis is in the top layer, in the epidermis. Uh, and if you look at the number of genes that are being expressed, again, most of them are up here in the epidermis with some of them kind of being here in the upper layer and kind of going down. This is a hair follicle. That's why it kind of extends a little bit down here. What we have been doing is to kind of take the data you get from those single cell technologies and really link it in with the, um, with the information that you can get out of the tissue itself and see really where things are happening uh, on that single cell level. So you can use tools like bioinformatic tools and software tools to really bring very different technologies together to kind of get something much, much more. Uh, so this is a bit of a simplistic view, but again, we can see that the keratinocytes, when we look use the single cell signatures, we can see that the keratinocytes are in the top layer. We're not detecting many uh, pigment cells or melanocytes. The sweat glands, the acrine glands are kind of deep in the skin where you would expect them. The endothelial cells that are growing are mostly in the upper layer of the skin. The fibroblasts are kind of throughout the, uh, the, uh, the dermis. Same with smooth muscle cells that are around the blood vessels and around the hair follicles. And then the immune cells are mostly here in the top layer. So the T cells, the myeloid cells, and even the mast cells. So it kind of helps you to really reconstruct the disease process um, in the computer, so to speak, and, and see where things are happening in the, uh, in the skin. And what does that really tell you? This is what you can get when you, when you kind of dig dig deep down into the pathogenesis. Uh, so if you look at all the potential interactions, so again, the single cell and the spatial seek information kind of allows us to kind of dissect how the cells are talking to each other and communicating. And if you look at all the things that are going on in, in psoriasis, you can see that it's an enormously complex network of, of, of interactions between different cell subtypes. So each box here is, is a different cell subtype in psoriasis. But what you can do using the spatial information, you can really see which are the main cells that are kind of talking together in psoriasis. And when you do it that way, you can see it's the keratinocytes, fibroblasts, myeloid cells, and T cells uh, that are talking together uh, across one another. So this is the box. So these four types are the ones that are really 
the key cell types they're going to focus on in, in, in psoriasis. And the color tells you the number of pairs that we can see, so receptor-lichen pairs. And what you can then do is you can start to kind of look at it, uh, not all of them, but, but focus on, on a key of them. This is just focusing on, on chemokines and cytokines. So you can see what's really, how are those other three communicating with keratinocytes? So you can see the keratinocytes are over here. These are the myeloid cells, T cells, and fibroblasts. And you can see what they're making, how that's feeding onto the keratinocytes. And you can do the same for the fibroblasts, the myeloid cells, and the T cells. So in a way you can unravel and, and, and really get a very uh, highly detailed view of, of, of how these cells are all working together in terms of driving psoriasis. And, and, will, and at the same time gives you a very detailed information what you can target and, and what would happen if you actually target it. And, and how can you collapse the disease process in a way that will not just lead to remission, but also potentially cure. So just to kind of summarize what I've talked about. So psoriasis is a complex genetic disease uh, we, with over 80 genetic lo loci uh, with genetic signals identified to date. Um, but it's striking and I, I really didn't show you this, but only a very small fraction of these uh, is currently targeted by existing treatments, so it's less than 20%. Um, you know, what about the other 80%? Is, is that where we need to go to really being able to fix psoriasis? Um, psoriasis as a disease, uh, it's obviously very complex. It has features of both autoimmune and autoinflammatory processes. And the current treatments that we have are almost entirely focused on one subtype of psoriasis, the plaque psoriasis, and only one arm of the immune system, the, and, and that's the, uh, the autoimmune, autoimmune arm. We don't have any treatments that really target the autoinflammatory axis of inflammation and psoriasis. And as I kind of showed you uh, in just a couple of slides, we, we, really, we have these new technologies that are really allowing us to get an unprecedented view of the uh, pathologic mechanisms that are operating in psoriasis and psoriasis subtypes and also in psoriatic arthritis. Um, and I, I think that, you know, the goal of our current research, uh, at least the ones that is, is going on in my lab and in, in my colleague's lab, and this has also been what, what the National Psoriasis Foundation has been emphasizing, is not just to kind of figure out better ways to treat psoriasis, but also to really move towards how can we permanently get rid of psoriasis and lead to a, like a long-term remission without being on an active chronic uh, treatment. So that kind of concludes my talk. Uh, I, I just want to uh, kind of highlight many of the institutes and foundations that have uh, supported my work over the years. And, and first and foremost is the uh, A. Alfred Toppen Medical Research Institute. It's played, played a really a critical role in, in, in helping me build up my lab and my research operation. And uh, we're very excited with where things are kind of heading. And I think we'll be making, uh, you know, big impact on, on this disease in the, in, the, in the near future. So thank you. Excellent. Johan, thanks uh, so much for a, a very thorough uh, 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 survey of the, uh, the field, um, from both from the clinical part and from the uh, basic mo uh, molecular biology part. So just a couple of questions are, uh, that were uh, posed and, um, and I invite other people to, to write in uh, questions. We'll, we'll be happy to answer them. Uh, first one actually comes from me. Um, um, I'm very interested in this, uh, uh, the relationship that you talked about between obesity and psoriasis. And I'm wondering which way you think that goes. Is it is it, um, um, is it uh, psoriasis increases your food intake or changes your metabolism? It seems like the skin is much more metabolically active and being such a big organ, I'm surprised that, that you wouldn't lose weight. Um, and I guess the flip side is, is obesity uh, related to an increase in inflammation and that is exacerbating psoriasis. And I guess the real question is, is does weight loss help psoriatic skin? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, great, 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 great questions. Uh, yes, uh, it actually is. Uh, so obesity is not just a side effect of psoriasis. It also is causative, or, or at least the evidence that we have indicates that that's the case. We have used like sophisticated um, statistical tools to really kind of dig into that. And we've used what they call Mendelian randomization to really get uh, a, a sense of the direction of the effect. And it seems to be that obesity 
increases the risk of psoriasis. So, so that, that seems to be, be, be clear. And there, there, is, there are some shared genetic risk signals that are actually overlapping between the two. So we've done GWAS on that or genome-wide association studies on that as well. Um, that being said, I, I think also psoriasis does predispose to obesity. Again, uh, the uh, psychosocial impact of psoriasis is that great that people sometimes avoid, you know, going to you know going to lakes or exercise out, outside or or even go to the gym, uh, and and that usually will make things more difficult to kind of a control. They kind of a uh, like we've been doing during COVID. You kind of get stuck at home in a way. Um, and that's that certainly doesn't help with with that aspect. In terms of the weight loss, yes, it actually does help. Uh, that's been been shown, and it may also make the existing treatments for the patients are they may respond better to them. Uh, so it, it does go go both ways. Um, to really see weight loss effects arises. Uh, the most dramatic improvement that I, I have seen reported is, is when they kind of go on like a very low calorie diet. Um, but I, I think it's unmistakable that weight loss does improve things and, and certainly with arthritis and, 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 and even skin psoriasis. Um, and again, it's, it's something that is very worthwhile kind of uh, pursuing. And, and I agree with you, it, it's obesity is a pro-inflammatory state and it will feed into everything. Great. Uh, we have a, a question here that I think is near and dear to your heart and mine as well. Is, um, are there any precision medicine approaches to determine which is the best treatment uh, for psoriasis? Um, uh, uh, the questioner uh, states that trying different biologics takes months, if not years, and is a crapshoot uh, in a way. Yeah, none. We, we've, we've looked at it and we've, we've published on it. Um, the genetics only take you so far. Those are the genetic signals that are not enough to really get you to the point where you can predict treatment response. Um, and the reason for that is it's not fully clear. Um, we have looked, you know, psoriasis, you know, we call it this, call it one name, but again, it, it's, it's like you can appreciate from the photos that I had in my talk, you can see how widely it varies from one individual to the next. It's a very, you know, a range of, of clinical manifestations. And we've looked at it also um, in, in terms of the, what we call like heterogeneity. The, it's like, what is the difference from one individual to the next? And a disease that looks, is much more similar than the photos that I showed you. Uh, but what is the difference? And if you look at, you know, and, and there actually turned out to be quite significant differences from one individual to the next. And if you looked at how you could kind of sort out how much does the, genetic predisposition contribute to that variation. You know, some people are gonna have 25 risk genes and other person is gonna have 20 or, or 30 of them. And they're not gonna be the same because we have like 80 of them. So how much does that contribute to the difference from one individual to the next? And when we looked at it that way, it was only about 25% that you could explain uh, of the variation. So again, that leaves, you know, 75% of the variation that is unex unexplained and then what we have evidence for is that there are the genetic signals that that um, modify uh, the output. So again, you have the predisposing thing, then you have everything that will kind of fine tune the disease and, and shape the manifestation of it. And that's that's where the uh, the, the prediction may actually come from. Um, and we have some evidence for that. But again, that's we're still early in that work. And again, we 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 don't know yet how well it's going to work. But yes. That, probably combination of the genetics, the, the genetic modifiers, and then like a snapshot of what's going on in the plaque uh, using other technologies such as uh, transcriptomic features are, are really gonna get us to the point where we can predict. And I, I do think it's possible, but we're not quite there yet. Okay, great. Um, there's a question that asks, uh, are treatments like uh, MB or UVB or topical steroids only treating at the surface level or they do they really interfere with the inflammatory cycle that we're seeing? Yeah, the evidence that we have indicates that it probably is treating mostly at the surface level. Um, like there has been a group that I looked at UVB and see that actually decreases the cardiovascular risk and that did not seem to pan out. Um, these treatments are though effective and, and you would expect that by decreasing the inflammatory load of the skin, they would offset things. But again, um, 
it's it's not as as conclusive as we think. And I, it looks like you need you really need these uh, inside out kind of treatments to really offset the uh, at least the comorbidities. Okay. Um, this is a, a, a specific question, and then uh, a, a probably a, a, a wider question. Are you familiar with uh, TALTS, TLTZ? I don't know all these drugs. And what's your impression of it? And how dangerous is it uh, during COVID to be on an immunosuppressant? Yeah, uh, I'm very familiar with, with TALTS or Ipsicizumab. It's one of the anti l 17 agents. It's incredibly effective drug and, 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 and works really fast, um, which kind of distinguish, it, distinguish that one from the other biologics. Um, it's pretty safe, fairly few side effects. The main risk of it, or main side effect actually is increased frequency of upper respiratory tract infections and symptoms. Uh, but there's no data that suggests that it's harmful during COVID. Um, um, so it, it, it seems to be pretty, pretty uh, safe based on everything that we have. Great. Um... Uh, what about the microbiome in psoriasis? Has there been investigations done to see if, you know, the, does, does uh, psoriasis cause a change in the microbiome or does the microbiome affect um, mm -hmm. the uh, severity of arthritis, or excuse me, psoriasis? Yeah, it's a really interesting, interesting one. Uh, and a lot of it just don't know. So, the, so if you look at the skin, the microbiome in, in, in psoriasis actually is very different in psoriatic plaques than, than normal skin. And one thing is that, um, that uh, psoriasis is, is, is a very unfriendly environment to microbes. Uh, it's characterized by pro-inflammatory cytokines that make a ton of what we call like antimicrobial peptides. Uh, and it just wipes out most of the bacteria in the skin. So again, there's much less of them. There are some, and those are mostly staph type type bacteria, but it's a very unfriendly environment on the skin for, 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 uh, uh, for bacteria. Uh, there is very clear link between bacteria and onset of psoriasis, triggering of psoriasis. That seems to be actually in the tonsils with strep infections. And there have been some reports that even removing the tonsils can actually help improve psoriasis and stabilize it if, 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 uh, if things are kind of unsteady. So there's probably is some link between the oral microbiome and the skin. And then in terms of the GI tract microbiome, I, I think not much known in psoriasis. Uh, I have not been any aware of any like fecal transplant studies really showing remission or improvement in psoriasis. But if you look at mouse models of psoriasis, if you keep them in a sterile environment or give them antibiotics, uh, you can actually prevent the onset of skin inflammation. So there certainly is a GI skin link. It's just one that we just don't understand yet or understand well. Thanks. Um, there's a question here uh, about comorbidities. Uh, uh, can, can the uh, comorbidities that are associated with uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, such as myocardial infarction, um, uh, be uh, changed, the risk changed by lowering the BMI? Um, this person says they're on uh, a premolast. Um, and so given, given everything, is it, is it, do you have to just give up or, or you know, does weight loss really help the metabolic milieu um, uh, that's associated with psoriasis? Yeah, I think exercising and keeping a low BMI is going to be great no matter what you have. Um, yes, I, I, my feeling is that it, it, it's going to help to make psoriasis a bit more manageable. Uh, but the, there are no real studies that, that have yet been done that really show that it's going to decrease the risk of comorbidities. We expect that to be the case, but we just don't know yet. Okay, thanks. Uh, actually, this is a, I think this is a great question. Are there uh, current studies locally involving uh, psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis uh, that need subjects? And if so, yes. <laughs> um, um, what are the appropriate contact points? So uh, here's your chance to advertise. Uh, yes, I, 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 we we all we, we we definitely need help with 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 many other studies. We have very active research program, and we're looking at, you know, you know what's happening in the skin and even the, the joints uh, with with skin biopsies, and we're using these like state of the art technologies to really address what's going on. So, you know, feel free, you know, reach out to me anytime with an email or 
uh, I'm happy to kind of uh, link you up with my uh, study coordinators. And, and, and again, uh, a lot of the work, this work that we are doing actually is, is, is directly uh, supported by the top and institu institute. So again, it would be, we would love to get you. Um, okay, so uh, so they should just uh, email you. Um, if other people don't want to do that directly. I think you can just email. I think um, you all have some contact uh, given the uh, flyers are sent out. So if you reply to those, we can we can uh, get you uh, to the right people. Yeah, and I put my email on the uh, the chat. Okay, excellent. Um, although I don't know if this chat goes, I think the chat only goes to the panelists and not to the oh, everybody. Oh, okay, okay. But uh, I, actually, Glenn, maybe you can, uh, can you post it so other people can see it? Yeah, I, I will, And but the chat is for everybody, but I will. Okay, gotcha, all right, thank you. All right, and then, uh, let's see. Uh, there's one question, uh, can psoriatic arthritis affect the jaw? And, it can't. Uh, uh, it's not a common location, thankfully, uh, but it, but it definitely can. It can involve any 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 joints, um, yeah. and usually it would be a rheumatologist that would be the more, the person to kind of manage okay. that, or, or that's the person to kind of reach to. Excellent. Um, I think that's all the questions that we have lined up for today. Um, uh, and since it's approaching the top of the hour, I think we'll, we'll stop it here. Johan, thanks. It was, a, it was a, great, uh, a great session. I really appreciate your time. I know uh, you're a busy guy, and so uh, twisting your arm to do it, I really appreciate it. And I, thank, no, uh, no in, <laughs> and I want to thank everybody in the audience for attending today. Hope you learned a couple of things. Uh, look forward. I think we have a, a, another uh, Health You Talk next month. Um, so uh, keep your eyes open. We'll be sending out an in, uh, invite to us. So, uh, if you have any questions in general about the Taubman Institute, you can go to taubmaninstitute.org uh, and uh, you can contact us through there. Um, so have a great afternoon, everyone. Yeah.